which is plus or minus 25% of the uh, long term rule, long term average. And then that black dotted line is the long term average for each site. We've got um, on here that there is a red line, which is the uh, one of the, our recent dry years, which is 2012 to 13. We've got the blue year, blue line, which is um, last year's flows, and then the current year being in black. And as you can see from over all four site periods, they all show a similar pattern, with uh, September being above normal, uh, October mostly um, below normal, and then this November's rainfall being in the close to normal conditions. Um, Um, for December, um, because we've had quite a bit of a mixed bag already, um, it's not really worth actually trying to give you a, a mean flow for the years not so far. So, what I've got to just show you now, which is slightly different than I've done previously, is for latest flows. Uh, our um, Marcom's team, Marcom's team, and uh, a few other parts of the council have done a great job in updating our website in the way that we present our flow information, rainfall information, and river levels. So I'm actually just going to show you quickly to take you to the website to show you how you can view the, the flows and various data. <coughs> so um, there's a number of ways you, you can look at the sites to start with. There's a, there's a map um, showing you the spread of the sites across the region. You can also view them as, a, this is a, just for river levels and flows, there's a table, so you can go through either an alphabetical or north or south, depending on how you want to view the sites. Uh, and then essentially for each site you can go to a, um, a chart for that site. Um, and I'll just take you to um, just those four sites that we're currently showing as a snapshot for this presentation. Um, you can basically have a 30 day plot, a 14 day plot or a 7 day plot, so you can get a bit of a feel as to um, so what's going on at the site. This is the Hunarola, so there's been quite a bit of rain up north in, 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 at different times throughout the um, last month, the last 30 days, so you can see how the rivers have been responding to those events. Um, currently, um, at, this, um, at the end of the Hudra up here, you can see we're sort of in a recession, so um, we've got the Esk. Again, um, you can see it responding to those rainfall events throughout the month. Hill, and um, essentially, you can see right at the end. In fact, I'm going to zoom into seven days to give you an idea. You can see the response to the rainfall we just had over the last day or so, which has been a lot of those storms and, and things. So, um, this gives you a base, basically an idea, and, and probably a more relevant, especially after these common briefings, if you want to go away and actually have a look through um, to see how what any rivers or interest in, you know, might be interested in to see how they're responding. And um, The other thing we also monitor um, for um, in relation to consensus is obviously abstraction bands and low flows. So um, on the website too, you can actually go through and look at the current status of um, uh, abstraction, abstraction bands through all the sites that we monitor throughout the region. Um, we haven't got many on band at the moment due to the rain. There's a few, I think, um, this is a snapshot on that map from, from Monday, I think it was, or Tuesday. So there's a, there's a couple of sites which have got um, a range of uh, flow, minimum flow levels, so they're on, some of those are on bound on the upper levels, um, but most across the region aren't. And then moving into the sort of um, outlook for the next few months, which is based on NEWA's climate outlook, um, river flow is likely to be normal or below normal, um, according to 35% chance, and less likely to be above normal. Um, that's a quick summary of the flows. Um, anyone got any questions? Um, Rob, on your river flow map, um, you've got the little arrows on the river going. Um, yep. Interest to give an indication of whether it's rising or falling or, or stable. Um, there's a little bit of work in progress going on there because you see 
some rivers have got natural fluctuation, mm -hmm. for example, the Wadal, which is tidal. Um, I noticed the other day it was sort of like going up and it's going down quite regularly, but it's probably not a true representation of <laughs> yeah. coming through the river. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the attention. Um, trying to give an indication is to, you know, a, a quick snapshot so you can get an idea if, if obviously you can, if everything's pointing up, there's a pretty good chance there's obviously rain going on. But it's just to help kind of describe what's going on in a, in a you know, very quick, quick way. So. so is that real time? Or is that, that the website's real time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Hourly or days? Uh, it's it's hourly, I think, for all our right. sites. I think we set up as hourly. Yeah, um, it just really where we get conversation up yeah. on the update. It yeah. depends on the domain. So some are updated more frequently than others. Right. Um, I think the rainfall is only showing daily, so there might be something more into your visit. Yeah. Um, if you are using the new website and you discover that things aren't working well for you and you have trouble either getting data or displaying graphs, please can you let us know. Um, by all means email me and I'll take it up with the web team. And we have noticed there's a few idiosyncrasies about the way in which things are presenting. <coughs> we don't use it all the time because we have other ways of looking at our data. So if you are seeing things not working, do please get in touch. Um, like um, Professor Gibbon introduction to some of the other people that uh, are new here. So, Simon and I help manage the groundwater level monitoring network. Uh, we have over 100 wells across the region, but my talk mainly focuses on the Hirotom and Rua Tanapa. That's where the greater pressures are and where most of our um, larger groundwater resources are. So that's what I'll be talking about today. Our, my groundwater level is a little bit different than rainfall and rivers. It's a snapshot where it's just a point measurement, whereas you know the rivers and the, and the rainfall, they'll look at the overall average across the whole month so this can be influenced by a, a strong peak at the end and make that average look a lot bigger than perhaps what those flows were across the time and my gravel levels can be influenced depending on the time in which they take it so obviously if it's a dry and the start of, and the start of october and they take a measurement there it can look low but you know during the end of the month it may be bumped up to just some kind of recharge event but we won't capture that so keep that in mind as i go through so yeah, we haven't got December because the boys haven't um, done their December measurement yet, so I focus on November, but what I've done is um, I've just pulled up some of the telemetry plots to give you a snapshot of what the December water levels might be looking at, and they run every 15 minutes, it gives you an idea of what the pattern's looking like for that month. So I'll start off with the Herotong, and I'll just go through a general pattern of how this month, or November's month's conditions compared to historical ones, you know, are they normal, below normal, and then I'll move in and look at some hydrographs, some representations of the pattern that's going on there, followed by the Rua Tanapa. So, here we have the Hiratonga, and I've got October versus November, and different colours to represent the different ground wall level conditions. I try to go like a traffic light kind of system, with green being safe, being kind of normal, and red being the lowest ever, Yellow being below normal, uh, obviously light blue above normal, and dark blue being the highest ever. Again, the other thing to keep in mind is the number of years that have been monitored. So in those circles, hopefully you can see if you've got really good vision, are some numbers of the duration of monitoring. So clearly when you have a short record, you're more likely to reach those extreme levels. So you know when you do see a red, have a look at the number in the middle and go, okay, it's only six years, so maybe you know, we're gonna experience more of those. What I usually tend to do is just take a step back and go, what's the general colour pattern that I see? So in October, generally things are reasonably normal. There's a, flow, a few below normal levels. Uh, and things didn't change too much in November either. The, the boys measured quite early in November. It was about three weeks apart from their last measurement. And you'll find that the irrigation and uh, the low levels didn't really kick off until We'll start really seeing it in the, the end of the late November, particularly in the Royal Town But here in the Hirotonga, things weren't too different between October and November. We quite often have these below normal areas in the recharge area between Roy's Hill and Third Hill, uh, and we can see some lowest ever and below normals going on in there as well, but elsewhere, not too bad. Okay. These two plots should give you an idea of what's happening generally in most areas anyway. So, Except the bottom one only shows November and the top one shows November. Yeah, so because mm. so, we have telemetry on the top one, what I did was I had a wee look and said, oh, what's the measurement for December to give you, a, you know, what's going on there because I was able to obtain it. Obviously for this one, no telemetry and we've only measured November so far. 
Um, so for a flex mare, as you can see, oh, the other thing, a bit like Rob's to mention, the red line represents 2012, 2013, some of it was a really low year for us. Um, so it's a good reference block to see, to compare against. Uh, the green line is last year's groundwater levels, and of course the black line is um, the black solid line, is the current year, uh, and the dotted line is the medium. <laughs> The bands, let's just say below normal, normal, and above normal. This is uh, the 25th percentile, this is the minimum, 75th percentile, and this is the uh, maximum. But, as you can see from the black line in this unconfined area, uh, you know, it's pl plotted pretty much bang on uh, normal and right on the, um, the monthly median for this particular well. Um, and for the Confined area, which typically have artesian heads flying above land surface, ground was just on the verge of dropping into the below, but still just in the normal area there. Um, one thing to look at is that you know the 12, 2012 13 year didn't really have a major effect in the confined mm -hmm. area for this particular zone. It did, of course, in uh, Blacksmere, uh, but it was much later that it continued on, but we're way above from this time of year in those areas. This is a different plot that I presented last year. I'm not too sure how much use it is. I just um, plotted the difference in water level from October to uh, compared with November, just to show you how much things have dropped or, or risen. Um, and this, this uh, box plot gives you the range of what's going on. So obviously you can see that you know, most groundwater levels, looking at the triangles, obviously down means they've, they've declined, and uh, blue means they've, they've gone up. Uh, you can see that they've pretty much declined oh, roughly around about 30, 30 centimetres, roughly. Um, the maximum is about one and a half metres, and that's at uh, Talbot's there near the Paratua. This well is our most sensitive well on the Hurotonga Plains and has the greatest variation uh, throughout its records. So I'm not too surprising for that one. Uh, the two blue ones on the side there are highly influenced by tidal effects, so it could be quite that last um, month. They might have been on more of the low part of the tide than they measured, and then this month they might be more on the high, so I'm not too surprised about those going up. This one's only two centimetres, so it's, you know, it's a pretty minor change anyway. Um, but that gives you an idea of how much, and I expect things to go down. You know, like I said, we have a cyclic pattern, and some of this, but this time of year things will keep going down. So you know, kind of expect to see triangles going down the whole way down until about March, and then they'll start going up again. But this just shows you the range. Real tenor is a bit more interesting because there's some really um, strong well interference effects in some areas, so we have some more extreme values. All right, there's a lot going on here. I've purposely removed the um, axes because I wanted to just show the pattern that's going on. Um, okay, what have we got? We've got one, two, three, four wells here, and they have different areas. The red well is again that black smear well that I was talking about that I was able to pull that December measurement out of. Um, the black line is bridge path, the green line, have a look, is in the recharge here between Moores Hill and Fern Hill. And the blue line is a new well that we put in um, up by Matara Road. Um, what some of the interesting patterns to see is that you know, when we do have a recharge event, whether it's a rainfall or a river flow, you tend to get these big spikes in groundwater levels. And you know, some wells respond differently. For example, the wells in the recharge area um, and bridge bar have a very strong river signature so they really respond to that river flow and they have that same recession limb on the end and it's a bit more damped and different settings. Um, so these other lines, September, October and November were approximately where we when we took our dips to give you an idea. So in September we had some measured here and we had some here so you know, the ones down here tended to be a bit more, more below them at that time but then we had a whole big collection of really high ones because this Recharge event really influenced our um, measurements during that month, and then October, but pretty much on that recession, um, everything was about normal, and November again, everything was about normal there. But what you can see in December is we've got this this other recharge event coming in, and I think the guys are measuring at about now. So you know, at a guess, things will probably be probably normal for December again, because it's also highly influenced by this recharge event, and things will start to go down again. Other things you might be able to see. You can see in um, Blacksmere, there's a 
strong cyclic, it's almost a daily cyclic pattern. I suspect that's um, because of municipal pumping, there's a bore field there, Portsmouth, so it has a strong cyclic pattern. The other thing, uh, uh, there was, maybe not this plot, but another plot where you can see some localised uh, drawdown effects, maybe here for example, and here, probably from a more localised um, pumping supply. So raw data was quite different. October, we had um, very high, uh, I won't say very high, normal groundwater levels. Uh, they were strongly influenced by that run, those rainfall events in September when we measured it. And then in November, so they were quite low, so you know, a number of uh, uh, record lows going on in there. They were measured a, lot, a bit later than Kiratonga, so they were measured midway through November, had more of a chance to feel the influence of people turning on their pumps and that prolonged dry, dry period that we had in October. So they were starting to feel that and you know people turned off and turned on and um, Jeff with his talk might be able to show some of those pumping patterns that are going on as well. <coughs> Two wells to represent those areas. We have our 1450H which is down by um, Stockade Road um, and well 2220 up by um, State Highway 50, Mr Apple. Um, you can see here that the groundwater levels, particularly at 1458, looks a little bit unusual. Usually we see that sort of thing in Wales 220, just suddenly dropped quite rapidly uh, between October and November. Uh, we're, we're, in this, we're below 2012-13 at the moment. It's hard to know what that means. Groundwater levels are very, uh, are very, they fluctuate quite a bit, so it can change quite quickly. Um, <coughs> And again, for 220, we've suddenly dropped off, and again, quite quite low compared to 2012-13. But again, things can change quite quickly, so it's hard to say. And you can see, when I get to the telemetry plot, that that recharge event is also kicking in in that groundwater system as well, so things might recover for December. Um, so same plot before as for Heratonga, with the difference in groundwater levels from October compared to November. Compared to the Hiratonga, much bigger differences here. You get much bigger change in the, in the raw tenor for system. It's not as transmissive, transmissive as the uh, Hiratonga, so you have more pronounced drawdown effects. Uh, and you can see that here, particularly in this Ashcock Burnside Road area. That's that 30 metre uh, decline that you see there. That's normal. We, we, we've seen that since 2004, since we've been monitoring. Uh, and what you see is it recovers pretty much every year. You get these beautiful recovery curves. But elsewhere, typically, you know, looking at the, the main block, the main block here, it's, it's a couple of metres change generally going on around the area from October to November. This here, um, you would have seen, maybe noticed another plot. It was a might have been last month, uh, an unusual reading. That's because last month it was a pumping effect, so it came as a record low, or maybe below normal, and it was a bit unusual. And the change is now 8.6, which, which means it's gone. It's risen heaps, it's because the measurement that they took last year would have been just after pumping, so the drawdown was really low in that well. Obviously they came back, you know, maybe it would have recovered quite a lot, so a bit of an anomaly going on in that one, in that well. So, we got three wells that were telemetered in the rural town of Bart. The blue line, I really like the blue one, is Station Road. I like it because it shows a real strong influence of a um, particular irrigator in this area, so I can see these. As I've said before, these lovely recovery curves. This is a uh, very um, typical recovery curve that you get after pumping that you see. That's uh, like almost a beautiful tice type curve. Now this well is out by Takapau, and this well is out by the Tuki Tuki River. Again, it's the pattern that I wanted to show. You can see that by October, you know, these people, particularly this well, maybe barely started turning on pumping, and then all of a sudden, they shut down, and for whatever reason, maybe rainfall or what, whatever they're doing, they've stopped pumping, it's gone back up, it's shut down, etc. And you can see that for this last part through December, well, there's not much pumping going on at all, particularly for this well anyway. Um, late November through to December, and groundwater levels are starting to, are starting to rise, uh, rise again. So we'll see some recovery in our December water levels once I, um, once I price those, process those. I think that's about it. So pretty much in summary, ground levels were about normal in Hiratonga. Um, they're quite below normal for Rotana for, for the month of um, November. Um, there was quite a rapid decline between mid-October to November, particularly in the Rotana. 
Uh, but as you can see from those telemetry plots, groundwater levels have started to recover a little bit. Um, that will be short. That will be short term. They'll start. To, they'll carry. They'll carry on down. They always do until March or February, March, April. Um, and so yeah, they expect to improve until December. Um, and that that is all I have for you guys. Any questions? So, first week of December, our people saying up that sort of route, route way, they had 160, 180 mules. Okay, yeah. So, we'd expect to see a marked recovery there, would we? For, for a short period until they start pumping again. You, it depends, obviously, um, different locations, different depths will respond differently. Um, obviously, those that are more responsive to rainfall, you'll see a quicker more rapid uh, recovery, um, and for how long, you know, obviously people are not pumping for as long, you'll, you'll see a, a greater recovery, so um, it all depends on a number of things, but I can see from those telemetry plots, as you know, that rainfall starting in no, late November, and the rainfall had in December, you can see the recovery going on, so yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd expect a bit of recovery going on, and because you get such big drawdowns, I expect the recovery probably to be, you know, big as well, um, so yeah. So yes. <laughs> I think a question for Simon. I, yeah, so on the domestic waterfront, did the did the levels drop? You know, in Cinder Holt's Bay, the levels drop low enough to cause concern for any domestic waterfronts? So the only way you can really gauge that is by um, public uh, phone calls yeah. telling us what's yeah. going on. Um, I didn't receive any. It's not. Typical at this time of year because it's still quite early. Yeah. Um, you know, once you start getting into those summer months when groundwater levels start to get a bit lower, uh, then we, you know, we do get we do get phone calls and some people do have problems. It's not just a function of um, the groundwater levels, also, you know, a function of the well design and where the pump intakes are and things like that, um, and how efficient your bores are, etc. Um, so at this stage, I haven't received any phone calls. That's not to say that there hasn't been any problems. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah. Didn't get that wrong. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> right. So this is a new new segment. Um, Jeff Cook from well, the data management team. We have the water information services in, in that team, so that's why I'm doing this presentation. What I'm going to give you is a, an overview of how things have been um, through time since 2014 and a bit spatially, so focusing on uh, Tuki Tuki area and the tank catchments as well. And, um, this is new, so if there's information that I'm not showing that you want for future times, then keen to hear what it is. And I'm just trying to give you a reason to start. So just from the start, um, just some information about the, the data as it were. It's quite simple, provisional just because our system, the way our systems are set up, pulling data from numerous sources, and there are some time lags in there, and this is all based on what we've got currently available at the moment. Um, so the numbers next time may be slightly different because we've got more information. And said that, this is for the whole Hawks Bay, overall trend in water use that we're seeing since 2014 to present. And we've split it roughly by the use types that are consented. So there's a base of industrial and uh, drinking water or um, municipal supply. And then the, the other uses are more rural. The combined mix is, is a classification that we've got where some consents are for irrigation and another use. So it's, it's classed as a combined usage. But a lot of those, or excuse me, the most of those is an irrigation type one. And you can see that the seasonal variation is apparent there and that most of that seasonal variation is due to the, the irrigation usage. Spatially, this is a, 
Is there a plot just taking kilometre grid squares mm -hmm. and how much water was used? I've used October because it's our most complete recent month. And you can see around, so this is Hastings, the flat spot in the middle. Around that area, you've got high um, density of usage, but it's relatively low levels. And over in the Tucky Tucky, you've got a much more scattered usage. Most of those low level usage is going to be um, irrigation and that's spread about across the area. And just to context that, the, the scale of 100,000 cubic meters per, per kilometer is equivalent to about 10 centimeters depth. So if people were applying, that's roughly, that's, you know, that would assume that they're applying across the whole kilometer and everything else, but just for a bit of context. Looking at the Tucky Tucky, so this is attempting to compare what we've seen this, this year with what we've seen in the previous four. So the blue bars are the maximum that we've seen in the last four years. The black are the minimum, and the colored bars are what we've seen so far this year. And you can see October was higher than we've seen previously, but still less than we've seen so far seen with November and we're also missing a little bit of data for November so that bar is going to going to increase slightly but won't expect it to increase much and over time you know we we're expecting that we're going to see more take during December January assuming it fits within that normal bell curve. Jeff, um, Susan here, <laughs> by drinking does that do you mean is that municipal supply? Yeah, so it's, it's municipal supply. Anyway. We've just used, these are actually MFE categorizations, so we've just okay. tried to stay consistent with how okay. other reporting has been done. So we showered less in November. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Water the gardens. Share a lot of water the gardens less. Yeah. So the, and then this is yeah. tanked to Tutai Curry, Nararo, and Karamu area. And again, you can see November, we're, we're missing our drinking water on municipal supply information at the moment, and that is due in the next few days. Uh, early part of the year, we, we're seeing less than usual use, but that could just be that we've got some of our, the use is on maybe on annual or three monthly returns for some of the smaller takes. October was higher than we've seen previously, but by a much smaller amount than we saw in the Tucky Tucky. And November, when we add in the drinking water supply, it's probably going to be normal, possibly slightly low, but it's, it's as we would expect. And that's pretty much me for the moment, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So 2014, are you working on a July, June year? What are you really working towards, or a calendar year? It's 1st of July through to 30th of June, so cold water year. So we've the, missed the drought year. Yeah, the reason we chose 2014 was with the water meter regulations coming in around 2010 and then the, the amount of metering that's been going on over time has, has increased. Um, what I didn't want to show was if people haven't got meters then we can't know how much has been there so we may have seen lower usage. We, we haven't looked back to see whether we can go back a bit further to give more um, more context. Yeah, it's just that the, the 12, 13 year being used as a benchmark. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. lots of things, including water use potentially. So, um, yeah. No, you, yeah, I guess you, if you can't measure it, you can't really report it. Yeah. So what Jeff's reporting here is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you've got a variety of different ways of presenting the data here in front of you. I'm keen that we make this useful. Mm. Um, so if you have a view on how the data might be combined to present it in a more useful way, or there are elements of the data that you'd like to see uh, that aren't here at the moment, it would be useful to get that feedback now or by email later if you'd like to provide it. So how specific are there? Could, could you, for example, hone in on, a, on the bridge power area as a, a you know, it's quite a tight zone? Uh, potentially, I mean, for, for the graphing, it's more awkward if we keep it as catchments, it's relatively straightforward. Um, 
it's not saying we can't do it, it's just to make it, to do it easily. Uh, currently it's, it's catchment, but if there's a need to go to a, to a tighter unit, then, then you can certainly look at it. Um, the other thing that we didn't present it there was a combination of surface water, groundwater in those, those catchments. It wasn't trying to split it by whether it was a groundwater aquifer, which is a different shape. So just thinking, what's the what's the lowest level for which you're measuring something? Or how is are there households who have got their own wells and their tunnel claims included, or what's the cutoff? So this is consented, consented. metered information, and it's presented at the consent level. So if we've got um, generally domestic, there's often and it's often a permitted take. Is, yeah. um, most of these are for irrigation areas, and this is summarised at the at a representative point for the consent. We haven't gone down to the take point level. We've got some work to do with how we're hooking our systems up to allow that to happen easily. We can do it, but it's not easy to do. Um, whereas what we've done here is relatively relatively easy now. But that's part of what we want to hear is what, we, what do we want to be aiming for? Yeah. So do you just so for these guys, who who um, legislation was who requires water metering and who doesn't? What limit do they require? They have to have. So under the water metering regulations, any take over five liters a second is best to have a meter. Um, and the the reporting frequency of that is <coughs> we've only been doing daily readings and give us the results annually. On top of that, we've got consent so we can require water meters at, for tanks that are less than five liters a second and we can require return um, methods that are different to that but the minimum set by legislation is, is that five liters a second. So generally all permitted tanks won't have meters so they won't have that yeah. but overall that's a really small percentage of the overall water budget they, they don't account for much so not a big pressure on the resource overall. So Jeff had a question. Um, a question for probably all of the experts. In October, the, um, some of the reaches in the Tukituki catchment were going dry, which they normally do in the middle of summer. Um, there was speculation that that might have been caused by groundwater pumping that was greater than normal in October. But what I'm seeing in your data, Jeff, is that there was higher than, nor than their normal pumping in October, but it was nowhere near as high as what you'd normally get in December, January, February. Um, so what do the experts think in terms of those reaches going dry in October? Is it more likely to have been caused by the groundwater pumping or is it more likely to have been caused by the lack of rainfall over that period? Well, certainly a lack of rainfall. I mean, it, had, it was early September that we had, had, a, had a lot of rain. Um, but then we had probably about, it well, as I know, October was below normal, but it was also that there was about, there was probably about um, 50 to 60 days where it was, um, uh, oh, rain was less than 10 mils, kind of, you know, um, consistently throughout that period. So it was, it was quite a prolonged, prolonged dry period around there. And the significance of the 10 mils? Kathleen, is that it doesn't do a lot of reach ups, is that? Well, yeah, we, and you know, we just, just we saw all the things soaking it up, and you could see that, um, I've showed that on, on a uh, soil moisture before um, we that had that, that spike, that more recent spike, it had gone below the, the 10% of for that time of year. I guess another interesting thing is that in November there's been more groundwater pumping than in October, but rivers have recovered and that's so totally due to rainfall so I'm speculating that the, um, the dry reaches in October were largely a consequence of, of um, low rainfall, low recharge there. Yeah I think the other thing too is that it's, you know, it's quite complex so river, we don't have information on riverbed loading obviously if you've got a whole lot of loading within the bed it can artificially make it look like the river's drying it's just the fact that your bed load's built up if you haven't got that groundwater extraction taking it away. So if that's building up over time, it will look as though it's drying more than regularly. I think for groundwater pumping too, like 
you know, the effect on the stream is not quite immediate or rapid, so it's going to take some time to manifest. So even though you might have some, um, a lot of pumping happening in October, those effects aren't probably going to be immediate and of high magnitude. They're going to dissipate over time and take some a delayed effect on it. So I wouldn't expect it to be pumping in October causing a rapid effect on groundwater. Um, it's not to say they're not reducing base flow, but they take some time to occur and uh, yeah, not, not be immediate, I'd say. And I think I mentioned to you, Jeff, that the um, potential for your transpiration, which is the evaporation that was going on with Spartan Goodmore yeah. in, that, in that period. Too. Those flows at the end of October going into the early first couple of weeks of November where the flows were lower, the lowest they've been really in that sort of month. So what you've just heard is the Hawke's Bay Regional Council scientists discussing their perspective on an integrated view of the way in which water resources in the two catchments work. Is it useful for us to do that as a formal part of this presentation at the next meeting or the one after um, to provide you with that more integrated view of how things relate to each other? I was going to ask if um, <coughs> these presentations as a whole, maybe not for, for us on because you're still um, eyeing out a few things that filling in gaps, are we going to be able to look at that afterwards? Yes. So, so they'll get published to the website. They'll get published to the website. Yes. Cool. With, with the presentations as well, which Great. are being videoed. Yeah. Brilliant. So an integrated approach would be useful. <coughs> it adds a little bit to the length of the meeting, but I think it's important to get that perspective. All right, we'll, we'll look at how we do that. Right. Any other questions for Jeff or for the scientists generally? I guess this water use data. So is it is it sort of the plan to, as the data becomes, you know, more complete, to make that more publicly available, so there'll be more transparency on this data on the website in the future. I would hope that we can work towards that. Yeah. Part of it's just working out what what people want to see. Yeah. And while we're saying it's not complete, it, it's as complete as we've got. At yeah. the moment, it's, it's as live as we've got. There's just some lags in the system with it's never been, if you like, it's never been designed to be used for live reporting. Um, it's been designed to be for checking compliance and potentially annual reporting. And we're just trying to bring it yeah. so that we can use it to give some context and feed into the discussions. Because I don't think I've seen the historical reporting in a public format. I've seen the presentations. Yeah. But I guess you would need a certain you need a certain run of data to actually have context. So I mean, the colours are quite interesting because you interpret every category that you use. I think is quite interesting. That's it. I think it just just adds to the conversation. Because you're talking about lags, you're talking about the reportability of the metadata. Are you in terms of some people can report that metadata monthly or three months or annually, depending on their consent condition? Yeah, we've got a mix of telemetry data that's coming in daily some stuff that's coming in, uh, people are supplying daily, we've got other stuff that's coming in monthly, but if, uh, depending on when in the month we get that data, it depends whether it's available for this briefing and, or and not. And not all of it's delimited, month. some of it's like no. Uh, no. recorded. So is there a, a plan, uh, like is council considering having a common fixed, or is it just not practical to do that? I don't think there's any plan at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's another conversation. Generally, larger takes and more pressured areas, so surface water takes and some of the some of the larger groundwater takes, things like that, that are limited. And then it's it's generally, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's generally the 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 smaller takes or the um, less pressured areas will have a longer reporting period. And there's a there's a historical side in there as well, just that it, it takes a bit to change your consent. So what's locked in there, it, it just means that we can't access the data as quickly. But you know, if that's desired and required, then that, those conversations can be had around how we try and move that so that we've got closer to live reporting. But the few said that the, the regulations say you have to return annually. If the consent conditions are more onerous, like every three months or every month, 
and you think that overrides the regulation. Mm. But it is it is the hunting side and the planting side catching up with what it is we actually want. And the tech that's behind it all, because of course we didn't do this until quite recently. That lives mm. limit the data from water mm. takes. Mm. And I mean there are people who have, don't use very much water who really get upset if you start saying that they might have to tell them to because it costs quite a lot of money to have mm. to do that. And and it's because sensitive equipment like that out in the field requires a lot of maintenance. Mm. So they think they've paid, they put it in, then it breaks down and they get it fixed and so people get fairly antsy about it all. So, yeah. so for those of you who don't know, this is Joe Rogers. Joe is one of our people who collects data in and manages it to make it available for people like Jeff to report and you all to see. Mm. All right, any other questions? Um, just one from, from me, Bob. You know, the average is sort of seeds and purine and, uh, and surface water levels mm. and our feeling at the moment is that our seasonal cure is going to be a little bit later this year because of, because of the wet months um, and that our service water, our, our farm dams and that are, are pretty well topped up and we're looking pretty good going into summer, is that uh, I heard one, one farmer saying his is overtopping his dam is overtopping yeah. down the central <coughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know, I haven't reports about the dams but certainly from a flow perspective I mean Looking reasonably healthy at the moment. Um, I guess things can change all so dependent on what weather we get through. Yeah, in the immediate future, it's still looking down seasons like this, and the maple seed showers popping up daily, and then some fronts crossing us um, with us in the next couple of weeks. So, not at this stage looking like it was certainly in the short term, like a long dry. We find a fair these meetings at rain, so <laughs> schedule more of these and when you need rain, really. Stop them when you need a bit of dry weather. Having said that, it could all change by the time yeah, we get round to the next right. meeting. So. But that's very helpful, Trevor. I know the last, the last session you offered to report on the, on the fire risk stuff. I think it's really good that Trevor's reporting on that. Um, you know, what the sort of so-called you know, curing looks like and probably a lot of vegetation. You know, you know, they're spread to growth again, so... So, you know, what the vegetation is looking like. So that'd be really good, Trevor, to be contributing that to the, to the monthly conversation. If you're happy to do that, Trevor, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that Kathleen's promised us uh, <laughs> an easterly system every couple of weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, in that case, thank you very much, everybody. Um, there is coffee and tea at the back.